everybody. My name is Hudson. It really is my real name. Uh, it's a family name. People ask me a lot if I I'd name myself that because I live in the Hudson Valley and very close to the city of Hudson. But uh, I was named actually after my grandfather, um, also a Hudson and an uncle Hudson. And now I've got uh, nephews and nieces named Hudson. So uh, the proud family tradition carries on. Uh, but for me, it was always part of my ambition, I would say, to come to New York. I grew up in Kentucky and I'd seen New York City on TV, even when I was a little kid, like five, six, seven years old. And I wanted to be there. I knew that's where all the action was and where stuff was happening and all of that. And New York City was on a river that had the same name that I did. And I, uh, I love that. So I, I uh, was determined to get to New York City. And sure enough, I did when I was out of college. and. Um, and beyond that, I, I, you know, like the regular path, I, I wanted to get a, a weekend house. So naturally, I looked in the Hudson Valley. I found myself up here, and um, I had a great break uh, with uh, doing children's books. I was a freelance illustrator, and um, a children's book editor just saw some of my illustration and looked me up in the Manhattan phone book and called and asked if I'd like to try to write and illustrate uh, my own book. And I did, and that's what got me started. And so I got pretty well known for many books. And somewhere in there, a teacher said, have you ever thought of doing a book about Henry Hudson? Because you got the name, right? You got the name. And I looked into it and Henry Hudson didn't really have a whole lot going for him. He did just, you know, sort of, he was the first European to come to our river. But what I really found that really grabbed me was all the history of the Hudson River. And nobody had done a book about that before. There was all these different little bits and pieces of things, important things that happened on the Hudson River. Um, but I thought, wouldn't it be a great idea to string them together and uh, make a book about that? And I thought about, like, what could I do? Because I'm not really a historian. I just, I love history and I love people. And I thought, you know, I dreamt of coming to New York. How about doing a book about dreamers that were inspired to come to the Hudson River and the Hudson Valley? Because that's really what made it. And I always feel that what we call the American dream really began here in the Hudson Valley, on, on the Hudson River. Um, that's what makes it so great. It, it wasn't the pilgrims in Massachusetts or uh, the Brits down in Virginia. The American dream really began here with the Dutch because you know why? They came here for business. They came here for trade and they weren't trying to conquer land. They just set up an outpost and wanted to trade with whoever wanted to trade with them. And not only that, but they opened up their little colony to anybody who wanted to work hard and live there with them. As long as you played by the rules, you didn't have to be Dutch. You didn't have to be anything uh, other than who you were and what you did that would contribute to the greater good. And pretty soon within three or four years, you could hear over 18 different languages being spoken in the little uh, village, the little outpost of, of, of New Amsterdam. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself because I'd actually like to read it to you. And then we'll talk more and I'll show you the pictures as we go along. So here's my book, River of Dreams. I thought that would be a good way to pull it all together by all the dreamers whoever were inspired to come here. The story of the Hudson River. So it begins this way. That's me as a little kid, just gazing out the window at the stars. And I'm saying, when I was growing up in Kentucky, I used to dream about New York, the great city on the river that bore my name, Hudson. 
it seemed as far away as the land of Oz and just as magical and mysterious. At night, I would end my prayers with, God bless mommy and daddy. May I please have a horse and go to New York. Amen. And then I would drift into dreamland, picturing New York's skyline reaching up to the stars. It was a place of wonder and possibilities, a magnet for dreamers like me. But the magnet's power actually came from the river. It had been drawing dreamers to it for a very long time, long before there was a New York, long before anyone called the river or me, Hudson. And so that was my theme. I, I, I saw that there was a lot of dreamers that came to New York long before me. And the first ones were uh, the indigenous people. Um, we have essentially three different uh, tribal or language groups that populated the Hudson Valley long before white Europeans came along. And in our area, um, it was the Mohicans. They were an Algonquin speaking people. That's who lived. And let's see, where you are in New Britain, it was probably close to the border of the Lenape people too. They were in the southern part of the Hudson Valley. Uh, the Mohicans were in the middle and to the north at the northern end of the Adirondacks were the Mohawks. And they were probably the biggest and the most, most powerful. But for 7,000 years, they all lived here in relative peace and tranquility. And, you know, it was their dream to find a, a land of plenty and they'd found it. But other people were dreaming too. Holland was a tiny nation with very big dreams. You know, Holland is only the size of the state of Maryland. It's really tiny. I mean, that's just like a few counties in New York state. The whole Hudson Valley is probably as big as the country of Holland. It was too small to be a great military power. So instead it turned to trade. The Dutch dreamed of finding a faster route to the riches of China. That's where everybody wanted to go because there was lots of wealth in China and lots of good stuff that European Europeans wanted to trade. Spices and silks and other fabrics. Um, so they hired one of the greatest dreamers of all time, Henry Hudson. Henry, Henry was a British explorer who had made two voyages searching for a new route to China. Both trips failed, but they made, made him famous. When the British fired him, the Dutch asked him to sail for them. In April 1609, uh, Henry set sail from Amsterdam. So here he is in his little boat, the Half Moon, heading northeast around Norway. And this is a very small map. I don't know if you can see it there, but you can see here's Europe and here's a tiny little country of Holland. And he was going to go north and east. You know, China's way over here somewhere or around here on the other side of the globe. But he ran into ice. And uh, so he made an executive decision out at sea, made a U-turn and decided to go west instead. The half moon crossed the ocean in September uh, and sailed into a great river. Henry hoped he had found the shortcut to China and his path to glory. He explored the river all the way up to present day Albany, but uh, <clears throat> before heading home. It was his account of the river, the first written by a European, which brought him lasting fame. But poor Henry never did find China. Two years later, his crew mutinied in icy waters in Canada up here, and they set him adrift. He was never seen again, but the Dutch were on the move. Hearing Henry's tales of a new world, they made ready to stake their claim. And so they did right here in the Hudson River Valley. And you see, I've drawn three small maps. Here's the whole Hudson River Valley. They called it New Netherland. And way down here is the island of Manhattan and way down at the very tip of Manhattan, this tiny little black dot was their little outpost called New Amsterdam. And it worked out well for them because they could trade with the indigenous people for, uh, for uh, 
gold and for minerals and uh, mostly for furs. That's really the beaver pelts. In fact, the beaver is on the New York State insignia. And I think it's on New York cities as well uh, because it made everybody so rich. But the problem was that <clears throat> they were doing so well that they couldn't attract enough of their own people over here. And pretty soon the Brits were getting jealous. You know, they had uh, colonies in Massachusetts and down in Virginia, which were failing. They were not doing well at all. In the meantime, uh, New Amsterdam, our colony, the one that began where we live, uh, was really thriving. You know, it was making money and making everybody uh, very uh, wealthy. But the Brits had the guts. And so in 1664, they sailed into New Amsterdam's harbor and without, without a shot being fired, they asked for the keys to the city. And the Dutch being very practical people said, okay, look, if we can just stay here and do our business, we'll, uh, you can run it. I, we don't care about the, the government. It's just about doing trade. And uh, so that's what happened. So New, York, New Amsterdam became New York and New Netherland became New York State. Uh, and for a hundred years, uh, it was uh, a British colony uh, and the British were determined to build up their empire. But you know, empires cost a lot of money to run and Americans were paying a lot of taxes and not being able to vote. You know, this was long before uh, we had the right to vote. We were just colonists and had to pay taxes and taxes and taxes to uh, the Brits who were essentially our overlords. And so it wasn't long before the idea of revolution went, was up in the air and um, pretty soon uh, all the folks in the Hudson Valley were ready to take to arms. And as soon as they heard that shots had been fired over in Massachusetts at Bunker Hill, that was it. It just all went up like, uh, you know, natural ignition, you know, a, a flash of fire. And the war was on, the Revolutionary War. And the Hudson Valley played a really key part here. Again, tiny little map, hope you can see it. Um, the, the main strategy that the uh, Brits had that seemed like really obvious, because as we know, our river, the Hudson River, runs north and south from uh, up in the Adirondacks straight down to New York City and, and out to the ocean. So the British thought if they took control of that, they would cut this part of the colonies off the other part because this is all where the population was. So they would cut the revolution right in half, right from the beginning, sort of like beheading the dragon. Um, so uh, they took New York City without a problem. That was fairly easy. And they began to come down from Canada and the plan was to meet in the middle, uh, as you see right here. But then this little bunch of ragtag uh, American troops, led by one Benedict Arnold, stopped them at the Battle of Saratoga. And this was kind of a shock all around the world, because here was the British, the greatest military power in the world at that time, being stopped by this little... Um, a group of, of, of people fighting for their own country. What does that remind you of? For me, it reminds me exactly of what's going on right now with the Ukraine and Russia. You know, a, a big guy picking on the little guy and the little guy standing up for himself. That's what you always have to do. You got to stand up to a bully no matter how it ends. That's the only way that anything's ever going to change. And look what happened to us, you know? We stopped him. Benedict Arnold stopped him. But I wish I could say that Benedict Arnold ended up being our great hero because that's not quite the way it went. In the meantime, they still wanted to take the Hudson River. And if you can see the map of the river, there's a big double bend in it right at West Point. I'm sure you've heard of West Point, the military academy, but it actually is a point. It's like a big promontory that boats had to go around like a double bend. So they knew that was a very key strategic point. In fact, George Washington called it the key to America. He said, whoever controlled West Point, control the river, 
whoever controlled the river controlled America and the war. So uh, the American uh, military made George the head of the troops at West Point. And Benedict Arnold was so angry that he wasn't made that. He thought, look, I just won this battle of Saratoga. We're still here because of me. And you give it to him. So what does he do? He gets very bitter and he turns the secrets of how to blow up West Point over to the British and uh, to a British spy. The spy was caught and was discovered that Benedict Arnold was being a traitor to his own country. And uh, he's lived on, unfortunately. Very few people know that he was a hero at one point. They only know him as our greatest traitor. Uh, that's what happened to Benedict Arnold. And you know, when I do my research, I love to kind of unearth things like that. I didn't even know why he was thought of as a, as a big traitor. And this is why, just because of, of uh, him uh, turning over the secrets of, of West Point. Anyway, the, they, they gave up on trying to um, capture the Hudson River and went on to uh, Virginia, New Jersey. There was different battles, but ultimately they just gave up and we won the war. And they, they, uh, uh, the Americans claimed victory and there was a, a, a peace agreement in Virginia. And after that, we were on our own. And that was really interesting to suddenly find ourselves being a new country. And the Hudson River was extremely important because back in those days, there were no highways. The only highways were the rivers and the waterways. And this is what more or less what the Hudson River looked like. It was the main super highway going into the heartland of America, you know, because everybody was kind of hugging around the East Coast. There was nobody uh, really living. It was just all rough wilderness out there. <clears throat> so it was just a few hardy souls. But most of the, the commerce and settlements and everything were in New England and over as far as the Hudson River, and then it dropped off. But there was a lot, you know, that just thrived on the Hudson River. It was all these wonderful sailboats. I love sailing. I love sailboats. And there's so many beautiful boats. This was the typical one that you'd see. They called it the Hudson River Soup. It was, uh, a, it was just um, a single sail, but it had a flat bottom and a uh, wide hull, so it could carry a lot of cargo. Uh, and then big square riggers like this did come up the Hudson. Now they probably weren't under full sail. They only did that when they got out into open waters, but I, they're so beautiful. I couldn't help but want to draw, uh, you know, paint it under full sail so you could get a chance of what they look like. And they came all the way up to uh, the city of Hudson and all the way up to Albany. Um, usually bringing uh, whale oil. They would, uh, uh, the city of Hudson became a big whaling port and they never dragged the whole whales up the Hudson River, that's a myth. But they would process them out at sea because whale oil was uh, how people lit uh, lamps back in those days, long before um, electricity or kerosene. But the big change came soon in 1807 with these two things. Robert Fulton uh, also lived on the Hudson River. He went to Paris. He came from a very well-to-do family. He uh, went to Paris and saw this new device. Somebody had come up with the idea for a steam-powered boat. Nobody had done that before. And Robert, obviously, he didn't invent it, but he knew a, night, a really good idea when he saw one and thought, how can I commercialize this? So he brought the plans back and figured out a way to make a, a very sleek, simple boat that could go up and down the Hudson River. Nobody had done that yet. And uh, suddenly steam power came to America and first and foremost, right here on the Hudson River, going up and down, stopping at all the different ports, Poughkeepsie, Rhinebeck, Hudson, all the way up to Albany and back again. And it revolutionized everything. Suddenly everything changed because um, it wasn't just that it was faster than sail, which it was, but it was more um, regular. You could schedule it now. 
you could go by a schedule. See, with the sail boat, you just had to rely on a good wind. You know, whenever uh, you had to wait for a good wind. But with steam power, you could schedule when your your load of wheat is going to go out or when your um, Aunt Tilly is going to arrive. You know, everything changed because of that being able to schedule it. So that suddenly invited industry to come to the Hudson River all the way up, you know, to Albany and beyond because everything now could go back and forth and back and forth much faster and easier. But that was only the beginning. What really, what came next was even a greater change to our valley. And that was the opening of the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal uh, was a dream too, up by one of New York's governors, DeWitt Clinton. And he'd actually picked it up from George Washington. George Washington was quite a visionary. And he thought, if there was some way to connect the Hudson River, which goes up and down, virtually down in New York City, with the Great White Lakes, which are way out west, if it could go across New York State and connect up to, with them, we could open up that whole part of America. And DeWitt Clinton was determined to do it. They worked on it for 17 years, hand digging a ditch all the way across, east and west, across New York State. Um, they called it Clinton's Ditch and Clinton's Folly because they thought it was, because it had to be hand dug. Can you imagine digging a ditch that went all the way across? And here again, another little map. I hope you can see it. You see, here's New York. Here's the Hudson River. Look how long the Erie Canal is. It goes all the way across, all the way out to Buffalo. And from there, it hooks up with all the Great Lakes. Lake Erie, Lake Huron, uh, Lake Michigan, all the way up to the far tip end of Lake Superior. Now, why do you think this was so important to connect out there? Well, for a lot of reasons, certainly for trade of, you know, more goods coming from there, furs and lumber and all that. But more than anything else, so people could move out there and start farms. This is the richest farmland in the world. I think it still is. It certainly was back then. And everybody wanted to get out there to uh, set up farms. And so now they could. See, there were no roads out there. But suddenly there was this big waterway that went all the way out there. And who was the biggest beneficiary, the one, the big winner in all that? None other than our New York City. Because all of the goods that were coming from as far west as all the way out here, Minnesota, were coming down this route to New York City, being traded with all the fine goods, you know, the silks and the china and the silverware and all that nice stuff coming from Europe, being traded in New York. And from that day to this, New York City is still the most powerful financial center, the biggest trade center in the world. So it's really what made New York, New York. That's why it's so important. And that's why I love history so much. It's so interesting to me to, to know that it's this one thing, the Erie Canal, that made New York jump ahead of Philadelphia and Boston and Baltimore. They were all just port cities. They were all about the same size, but suddenly New York just exploded ahead of everybody else and uh, became uh, the financial capital of the world. Um, I love this picture too, because this is, a, uh, this is a beautiful picture, but it's also about making money, really, believe it or not, because uh, the river would freeze over in the, in the winter time. And of course, people had fun on it. Here they're ice skating and here they're ice sailing, which was, and they still do that whenever the river freezes over. I saw them doing that this past winter. And um, uh, instead of ferry boats, they would have ferry sleighs. But here's how they were making money. This was long before electricity, so there was no um, uh, refrigeration. But there were things called ice boxes, which was just a big square box with a metal lining in it. And people would put a big block of ice in it like this. So 
the farmers thought, especially, you know, they were out of work in the wintertime. Their fields were under blankets of snow. They thought, look at all that ice. If we figure out a way to do that, uh, we can cut it up, store it till spring when the river breaks and we can um, ship it out and send it down to New York City. And that's what they did. It became a huge crop for them, just the ice crop. Um, the biggest um, uh, customer, of course, was New York City, all the folks that lived there. But beyond that, they were pretty soon they were shipping it to the rest of the country, all the way down to Florida and the Caribbean. It, Hudson River ice went as far as India. Why were they so successful? Because they were the first ones to do it. They were what we say, they were the first to market. They had a product. They were ready to go. They figured out their shipping system and they beat everybody else at it. So they were tremendously successful. So um, the Hudson Valley was just cooking on all cylinders. They were also the home of uh, the first cultural things happening in America. You know, by now, people have been living in America for almost 200 years. When I say people, I'm sorry, I mean. Europeans, white people, uh, you know, indigenous people had been here with their beautiful cultures for centuries before us. But in terms of what Europeans were doing, this was, these were the first times that people stopped long enough to write stories and they wanted a sense of their own history. So the first American author to make his uh, living full time as a writer was Washington Irving. And I'm sure you know the stories of with Van Winkle and the Headless Horse, Horseman, that legend of Sleepy Hollow. And also along with him, a little further west, but kind of connected with the same uh, community was James Fenimore Cooper, who wrote The Last of the Mohicans uh, and other stories of looking backwards. You know, we've been here for 200 years, so we were already interested in kind of creating our own kind of sense of history and our own mythology, our own culture of who we were. And uh, nobody captured that better than Thomas Cole and the Hudson River School. And if I understand correctly, I think you have a show at the New Britain Museum of Art up right now about um, uh, the Hudson River School of Art. And maybe you've got some Thomas Coles there. I'm pretty sure that you do. And <clears throat> You can see why he was so important. He was the first to go up river and paint pictures of our beautiful country. He captured this magic landscape that we kind of all take for granted now. But in the days before photography, people just working hard, say in New York City, didn't really realize what a beautiful country we had. And so he captured that and made them feel proud, made them feel good about the land that we have here. I like to say that um, uh, he captured that icon, that idea that we all as Americans live with called America the Beautiful. You know, we think of uh, America, our country, you, you know the song, oh beautiful for spacious skies, for amber graves of, uh, waves of grain, and it all, kind of that great sense of pride and nostalgia wells up in us. Well, he was the first guy to capture that in his pictures. So he was a big hit. Um, he died young, unfortunately, but by then a lot of other uh, young painters followed him and he created what was became the first American art movement um, in our country. That it too uh, happened right here in the Hudson Valley. Uh, of course, no dream lasts forever. And as I was saying earlier, industry found its way and certainly uh, the train came in and where should they put it? You know, it's mountainous and hilly on both sides of the river. So they put it, the train tracks right along the banks of the Hudson River. And that was the beginning of cutting people off from their river. And you can see here, and it was good in some ways because industry sprang up little industrial factory towns sprang up on uh, both sides of the river and they could take uh, 
trains, you know, coming and going. They could ship it in by boat or by train. And um, it built up the wealth of the industry and the prosperity for everybody. But it was starting to give a, a sense of that the river was only for that. It wasn't for pleasure. It wasn't for uh, the rest of us to enjoy. Um, meanwhile, there was still people coming to New York City because now, you know, it was the land of opportunity. They were all coming with their own great American dream. And by the 20th century, New York City had built up, you know, that tiny little outpost that the, uh, the Dutch had started way down here at the tip now looked like this. And it was, it was grand and wonderful. And uh, the great, you know, financial capital of the world. But unfortunately, it didn't really need the Hudson River anymore, um, except as a sewer. And that's exactly what it became. So, you know, by the middle of the 20th century, the Hudson River looked like this. And this is no exaggeration. When I was painting this picture, I saw a lot of photographs that looked exactly like that. Back in those days, the factories could spew just their waste, whatever it was, their filth, directly into the river. There was a big cloud of gray smoke that uh, hung over the whole river day and night, constantly. All the fish died. There was no wildlife left. Uh, all the, the ducks and geese had all long gone. There was nothing. There was just barges going up. Nobody wanted to be near the river. It really had become a big sewer. And finally, it came to a head uh, because the, the power company in New York, Con Edison, as it's called, uh, wanted to build a big power plant in the side of one of the great mountains, Storm King Mountain that is right on the edge. You see the river sort of wraps around Storm King. And um, a group of people led by this wonderful woman named Franny Reese just stood up and said, basically, enough's enough. The river can't speak for itself, so I have to speak for it. The mountain can't speak for itself, so somebody has to speak for it. And that was the beginning of the environmental movement in this country. Nobody had thought about uh, the environment before, like that it needed to be take care, taken care of. You know, back in those days, even when I was a kid, um, everybody just thought, you know, the wilderness, the wildlife, nature would just go on and on forever. It's infinite. Well, now we know it's not. We have to take care of it. It all dies, and especially in the age of chemicals and plastics, they don't go away. They don't return, they're not organic. So they don't just break down and return to nature. And that's what was happening to the Hudson River. And so this wonderful woman, Franny Reese, um, led a group of her neighbors and friends. Um, and it took them two years just to win the right to speak on behalf of, of, of the river. That decision to let them speak was called the Scenic Hudson Decision. And they went on to call their organization Scenic Hudson. And today it's probably the most important environmental uh, group uh, in the Hudson Valley, and one of the most important in the river. Uh, it still took them 17 years to uh, make uh, Con Edison go away and pull back. But in those 17 years, it raised a lot of consciousness, a lot of awareness, and they put a lot of pressure. And more and more people started coming and understanding what uh, was needed. And all these different little, um, they weren't little, they were important uh, laws and regulations uh, became passed. The Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Endangered Species Act, all these, all these different uh, regulations that protect the wildlife, that protect the landscape. None of those were in place, but you see, that's why it's so important to have a dream. That was Franny Reese's dream. And look what came of it with a group of dedicated people. And pretty soon by the 1990s, uh, wildlife started to come back. Here's the Atlantic sturgeon, the osprey, 
which I love when I'm out seeing them. They're beautiful. They're also called fish hawks because they're so graceful. They swoop down and uh, catch a fish, you know, right at the surface of the water. And of course, the bald eagle is my favorite. Um, we've got several nesting pairs just right around the Catskill area where I live. So here's how I end the book. And um, I say, <clears throat> I say this, see now, now I'm an old guy in my, my kayak, but kids are swimming over here and now it's swimmable. Here's a, uh, what do you call this, uh, sailing, you know, and lots of wildlife, they're fishing, they're swimming. 50 years have passed since I dreamed of going to New York to see the river that shares my name, and 35 years since that dream came true. I live in the Hudson Valley now, grateful to all those who came before me, following their dreams to this river, building this nation, sharing its beauty, securing its future. It's now my turn, and I would say our turn, to help in keeping the river of dreams flowing for all those dreamers yet to come. And here I am now as an old man in my, my kayak, and I'll be out there in a few weeks pretty soon. So that's the end of the book. So how are we doing for time, uh, Mr. Kelly? I can... Uh, yeah, I think that leaves us um, a few minutes for some questions, but beautiful book. And I mean, I think families and kids are going to love it. And it's such an um, uh, important message all the time um, about environmentalism and um, the awareness of our impact on the environment. But very good timing um, as this month is, is we have Earth Day coming yeah, up. Okay. So, and you yeah. know, we like to say, uh, I'm involved with the Thomas Cole house where Thomas Cole lived. And we like to say he was the very first environmentalist. He was certainly one of the first to talk about uh, environmentalism long before there was a word that we use, environmentalism. But he knew that, you know, he was English and he had come uh, from an, a land where the Industrial Revolution was already happening. And his parents and his family wanted to get away from that. Um, because they wanted to start their own business over here. But he knew uh, the havoc, the destruction that it wreaked. Uh, yes, it made a lot of people rich and it brought prosperity. There's no question about that. But at what price? And he was the first or certainly one of the very early voices to say, look what we have here. Look what we're all about to throw away with both hands if we don't keep it. And that's really the message of his painting. So people can go uh, to see your show and see, I think you've got uh, several Hudson River School paintings in your permanent collection. And, and, and just remember that when you're looking at those. He, it wasn't just a pretty picture that he was painting. It was that, but he was also saying, we have this now. It's up to you if you wanna have it tomorrow. That's really the message that he was telling all of us because it was dis disappearing quickly and he knew what was going to happen if, if nobody tried to stop it. Yeah, I think it's hard to, um, um, it's hard to see that when you look at the paintings in the galleries that of, um, from the Hudson River School, maybe what was happening um, to the rivers at the time, but I think your book really helps teach us um, all of its history and so I think that gives us a viewers of the artworks a greater appreciation for the river mm. um, and just the river in general. But yeah, yeah. Good. Um, yeah, like that message. So I have a couple questions for you, some about the book and some not. Mm -hmm. When did you realize you wanted to be a writer? Oh, uh, when did I realize I wanted to be a writer? That came really late. I uh, knew I was always a storyteller, but art came much uh, more easily to me uh, from the, as far back as I can remember, way earlier than being able to read or write, I was drawing pictures, which is typical, most kids do. So I was telling stories with my pictures. So I always loved that idea of drawing a picture and telling a story of this was going on and this is, oh, and here comes some planes and here's a monster coming in and 
blah, 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 all of that. Um, and I love doing that. Um, and I did write for myself as uh, when I was a young person. Um, and I loved writing in school, but I was always a really slow reader. I'm still a slow reader. So that made me reluctant to um, think about writing as a living. But, um, you know, what happened to me, uh, the story that I was saying before, I got an incredibly lucky break. Somebody came to me, a children's book editor, and said, how would you like to try to write and illustrate um, your own book? I thought, well, illustrate, yeah, I can do that. But write, are you sure? I mean, I'm barely literate. And he said, why don't you give it a try? We can always call in a writer later, uh, but just give it a shot. And you know what? I loved it. And I always love to say, sometimes you never know what you can do until you try. Because I just, I took to it right away. I realized this is what I was meant to be doing, of using my words as well as my art and, and putting them together like that. And so for me, when I write, it feels like a really bigger achievement. I know I can draw. I've always drawn my whole life that's that's almost like breathing to me you know doing art but i have to work hard at being a good writer and i that's i love that i, it's, I think it's always important um to never just do the easy thing you know stay at that front edge of what's a challenge for you that's the only way you're going to get better with anything and it's fun it's fun. i agree i yeah. agree all right how long does it take you to complete a book? So from ideation to publication? Um, I would say it averages about a year. Um, it varies, um, depends on the book. Uh, this book, River of Dreams, I would say, probably took about a year. Um, you know, what I start with, I have a couple of little props over here. Um, if you can see this, uh, I start with a storyboard because for a picture book, I just have a certain number of pages. Like a, this is going to be a 40 page book. This was for another book. This was for Picture in America. It doesn't matter. But what I like to do is put all the pages that are going to be, face each other in pairs like this. And then I can move them around to see how they're going to fit. Um, you know, so I know somewhere up here, is gonna be about the indigenous people and then the Dutch. And then somewhere in here, let's say the Revolutionary War, the Industrial Revolution. So, you know, post-it notes like this just give me a lot of freedom to move them over back and forth. And sometimes I'll, I'll do just like really quick sketches or, or a couple of words, early years, USA, New York, blah, blah, blah. And so that way I kind of, it's like a map kind of, a visual map, what I can see. Um, and then from that, I'll do uh, this, uh, which is called a dummy. It's basically just a little book that I make up and patch together myself of my sketches. I mean, I literally patch it, scotch tape it together. I scotch tape the words in. I have done it both ways. I've done it all online. It's easy for people to do all this type of work online. But I really love doing it this way because I just like feeling it, moving it around. Again, a, with a book, especially a picture book, it's always changing. You really have to be flexible with it. So all of that phase uh, takes, I would say, three or four months until I have a, a good idea of the pictures that I want to make. And um, then I start to... And also to show it, the best thing about that is that I can show that to my editor and we can go through it together and she can say, well, this is great, but you've already said it over here. You don't need to do that there. You know, she, she works as an editor. She helps me shape it. And then from there, um, I do my finished artwork. Now, these are all under uh, clear panels because they were just in a show, but normally they're, it's, it's just watercolor paper. I uh, hope you all can kind of see that. This is typically, uh, this is what I, I do. I do the, the artwork 
same size as uh, what's going to appear in the book. And then turn all the artwork over to the printer along with my text. Now the text is the very, uh, the excuse me, uh, the artwork is the very last thing I do because that's the hardest to change. So I want to know I really have everything right. With the text, it's just words. So it's easy enough if, if it's running long or if my editor cuts a whole thing out, which she does. She always, you know, says like, you, you say it in the art. You don't need to say it again in the picture. She's really, really good editor. But sometimes it's like, oh, I worked so hard at that little paragraph. Let me have it. We, we, we challenge each other a lot. But you know what? The book always comes out way better because of what I've learned from her. Anyway, so the last thing I do is the finished artwork. And um, then we see the, the proofs of, of the book. That's, you know, now you can see that these are just loose pages uh, with the, the printers. I dropped in all the uh, text into my artwork. And so we're still going back and forth. These are just, you can see just, it's kind of a mess. It's just loose sheets of paper that's been printed on. We're still looking at it and doing color corrections, saying this is that blue's not right or that red is too strong whatever and then um finally after that phase the last time i see it looks like this and the, the very last thing that a publisher a printer does is put on the binding uh they like to know how many they're gonna have and by the time just a few weeks before it comes out they uh do a count and they uh the, because the binding is the most expensive part of any book so they wait to know how many they're going to have. So that whole process, um, actually, if I include their part, it could take as much as almost two years because it'll take me anywhere from six months to a year to to do a book. And then uh, they like to get it as early as possible so they can put it together and make their corrections and then um, go out and sell it in, in advance. Uh, Using those uh, the dummies that that's called often used to fold and gather, uh, and uh, so a, a book takes a long time. It's, it takes almost two years to to from the yeah. idea stage to hitting the bookshelves. Yeah, well, thank you for talking us through that process. Um, um, two yeah. <laughs> two two um, uh, shorter questions or smaller. I hope I hope they should come easy. Um, <laughs> what, what is a piece of advice that you would give to anyone, whether they're younger um, or or older or in school, um, anyone who wants to be a writer or an illustrator? Well, I think my most uh, honest and sincere point that I like to make, whether you're going to be an artist, an illustrator, a writer, if you're, particularly if you're in school uh, and you want to do something creative, always be curious. Let your curiosity lead you. It's so important to not let that get cut off just because somebody else thinks it, whatever they think. Just don't listen to them. If you're curious about birds or mountains or football or chemistry, let that curiosity lead you because that's where your passion is coming from. And that's what really counts in life more than the money. I'm an old man now. And believe me, I am really glad that I always followed my passion because I never, I always loved what I did. And I'm very fortunate, knock on wood, that I could make a living at it. But that all started with my curiosity. Uh, like with this book, it was my curiosity about New York City. What's New York? And uh, so forth and so on. So um, I like to think that that, that is the, the foundation for everything, is your own curiosity about life, about your own life, about the universe. Great answer. Great answer. 
All right, our final question um, is, what is your favorite way to enjoy the Hudson River? And you might have given, um, uh, might have gotten a hint of that in the book, but what's your favorite? It can be an activity or just a uh, view. Well, Maybe there's a viewpoint there, somewhere. Of it. Uh, yes, well, you're right. I think I already gave it away. I love being in my kayak on the river. It's just so beautiful at sunset. It's magical. We're so lucky to have it. Um, where I live, Catskill, New York, it's across the river from Hudson. Uh, we have a beautiful marshland called um, the Ram's Horn Preserve. And it's very protected and bald eagles nest in there and um, wading birds and ducks, all kinds of things. And you can go into it. You can't take a big boat into it, but you can take a kayak or a canoe into it. And it's got two long winding creeks. And once you're in the middle of it, you could be in the Amazon rainforest. And you know what? I've been in the Amazon rainforest and it looks a lot like this. It really does. I just feel like, wow, this is so great that we have this nature this close to us. And that's the way it is all up and down the river. It's not just here in Catskill. There's many places. And again, we owe a lot to Scenic Hudson because they are in the business of preserving, setting aside uh, important land uh, that is adjacent, that connects to the river uh, that you won't find any place else. And, uh, you know, parkland and different open areas where everybody can go and enjoy. And it's never going to get industrialized. There's never going to be <clears throat> factories or, or condos built on it or anything like that. It's just going to stay preserved uh, so that we can all enjoy it. So uh, I'd say that I am very fortunate. I've got a few more years, I guess, that I can still go out in my kayak. And, uh, and I love it. I'm very grateful.